What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Brandon, back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, before we get started, a little disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, and the guest is not giving financial advice. So everything you hear on this podcast is strictly opinion and should not be taken as financial advice. We disclose if we have any holdings discussed in this podcast, and you should not be following us as financial advisors. You should discuss this with professionals before you get involved or invested. And as always, it's not financial advice. So please, please, please take this strictly as our opinions and for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get into the show. What is up, everybody? I'm back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast, and I'd like to thank everybody streaming me sats on any podcasting 2.0 app, such as Fountain. Those are greatly appreciated. I normally kind of like to read the boosts or reviews or anything like that, but I record at various times during the week, so it's not always best practice, but I do appreciate it. I do see them, and I try to reply to all of them, so it is greatly appreciated. I also, if you're listening to this on YouTube or um, wherever you get podcasts, please feel free to subscribe, share the show, help me grow, and uh, give this a thumbs up because uh, the more you help support the show, the more I can bring in some great, great guests. But not to foreshadow anything here in the future, I do have a great guest sitting here in the waiting room. I got Caleb for, for, we just went over his pronunciation. <laughs> Let's go. Up, dude? I'm already messing it up, but he's the senior market analyst at Cubic Analytics. He's been around the, the Twitter spaces a little bit recently. So if you've been around those on the Tuesday nights, he's been bringing in great insights. He's a former cor- corporate banking analyst uh, managing over th- $30 billion. He's got a great sub stack. I mean, I could just keep going on here for a couple of minutes, but Caleb, how you doing today, man? I'm good, man. Good to see you, Brandon. Yes, Caleb Franzen, the last name. It's uh, some of my German heritage. So um, yeah, anyway, some people, I think the actual pronunciation is more like Franzen, but um, you know, here we are in the States. So we're going to go with Franzen. Um, Yeah, doing well. Happy Wednesday. This week already feels like it's flying by. I know we're recording this right now. It's just after 1.20 and we're going to be getting the minutes here probably while we're recording. So um, that's kind of the news event of the day. So uh, yeah, it's been a fun start to the week, I guess you could say, especially if you've been a little bit short biased. So here we are. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I should be able to pronounce your last name, dude. I had a German uh, roommate straight out of Germany for like four years in college. So I don't know what what my problem is now, but uh, maybe it's the stage, <laughs> right? I don't know, but you got me. But uh, for those in the audience, you know, I gave I gave a little bit of an introduction, but why don't you get into a little bit of your background and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I've been infatuated with markets and economics now, basically um, starting a little bit in high school when I was applying for colleges, you know, I was going for an econ undergrad um, and then uh, kind of took like somewhat of an alternative route because all the universities I was getting accepted to were out of state, like University of Oregon, and I just couldn't afford it. So I did, um, I started basically at Santa Barbara Community College and kind of went from there. But, you know, initially started out actually as a computer science major and going into my second semester, my freshman year, I'd always been interested in markets. I was like, oh, there's this intro to investing class. I got to take this. Um, Two weeks into that course, changed my major um, over to finance and econ. So, you know, it's been uh, it's been a hell of a journey. Um, Ended up transferring to UC Santa Barbara, um, which is where I'm from originally. So, you know, small or hometown kid, I guess you could say. Um, Graduated uh, in 2018 with an undergrad with my bachelor's in economics And, you know, during the course of my uh, studies academically, I was doing internships in wealth management and banking, so on and so forth. And uh, my senior year, I was working at Merrill Lynch um, with two uh, financial advisors um, in their basically like ultra high net worth um, client teams. So that was uh, a really fun experience for me. It was a very kind of unstructured internship, but gave me a lot of opportunity to um, kind of uh, I guess you could say like sharpen my own kind of like analytical approach. Um, and these guys were super encouraging of me of, you know, kind of bring my own kind of flavor and style to their kind of shop, if you will. Right. And so um, that was really interesting for me. But I think during that internship, I realized I wanted to do something a little bit more um, intense than wealth management. Uh, the wealth management industry is fantastic, but at the end of the day, it really is a kind of people's business. Right. And, you know, for me being, really kind of 
wanting to scratch this analytical um, itch that I had, I was like, well, look, let me go onto the banking side. I'm early in my career. You know, I don't have any um, attachments or, you know, obligations. So let me go do the 70 hours in banking. And so I went up to San Francisco. I was working for a subsidiary of BMP Paribas um, as a commercial portfolio analyst. And so I was part of their, it was a very small team, very niche, uh, but we had basically full kind of um, uh, not responsibility. I don't want to say that word per se, but you know, we, we analyzed the entire loan book of their commercial portfolio. So I got to really kind of see how banking worked from the business side, from the risk side, how we're managing a 30 plus billion dollar loan portfolio across our different sectors, whether that's real estate, technology, agriculture, different geographies. And so I did that for about two years. COVID was a hell of a time. Um, I was on the COVID crisis management team as one of the main analysts kind of helping the bank to navigate that environment, both from a regulatory perspective and from a risk side and overall business side. Um, so that was, you know, I got this like real front row seat to, you know, dealing with even the Fed's uh, uh, corporate banking and lending program, right? So uh, that was called the Main Street Lending Program for those who might remember. Um, anyways, I uh, was not enjoying that position at all. I know this is getting to be a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I ended up uh, leaving that position in September of 2020 to go ahead and basically start sharing my unfiltered research opinions and commentary on markets and macro. So I started that on Twitter, um, basically in the tail end of 2020. Um, and I've just kind of been building a little bit of an audience there. And then I launched on Substack via Cubic Analytics. I think that was in May of 2021. So we've grown to almost 4,300 total subscribers on um, that newsletter, which has been amazing, just growing like bananas. I think we're up like 90% in the last three months. So it's amazing to see, you know, more and more people kind of join the team, if you will. And uh, yeah, just having a blast. Yeah, man, that's great. Uh, and it's overall like a pretty interesting background, right? A little bit of finance, a little bit of banking, but I kind of want to go into to the banking sector and you know, sure. that time period, because, you know, obviously 2020 was a whirlwind to say the least. Right. But it seems like you kind of got into you know, the overall investment world, 2018 ish time, you know, with the internship and whatnot. And that that's kind of an interesting time in, in my eyes, because a lot of people just think that we were kind of ripping and roaring all up until 2020 and then COVID kind of crashed. But, you know, for those that were kind of in the market, there was a little bit of like, you know, hints here or there that there is some cracks underneath the surface. Um, so, you know, when you kind of got started and got into that that macro environment, you know, what was, I guess, the overall just like vibe and just, you know, uh, I guess, viewpoint on the markets during that time? Was it more so like, you know, everybody was kind of worried of maybe not a, a recession or, or anything like that, but of maybe a slowing down of the economy or, you know, was it the overall perception like, Hey, you know, uh, pedal to the metal, the, the gas is still going, um, you know, everything's still ripping and roaring. Yeah. So, um, I remember 2018 very well. Um, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of the commentary, especially in 2022, you know, for different asset classes, maybe even something like Bitcoin that people were saying, Oh, you know, we've never been in, a, in an environment where the fed is raising rates or where they're doing QT. I'm like, do people not remember 2018? I think that really speaks to two main things, though, which is that um, obviously the monetary policy environment, while it was similar in that the Fed was tightening monetary policy in 2022, it wasn't remotely similar to how they were tightening policy um, in 2015 to 2018, right? Like if we, re if we rewind back to that period, the Fed forecasted to the markets where you are going to be raising rates 0.25% every other meeting. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't miss, right? So for basically two and a half years, that is the process that they took to raising interest rates. And then what started to happen was, you know, let me maybe say this, right? Is like people, um, I think in 2022, started to have this renewed um, appreciation, if you will, for macro and the Fed and interest rates. And, you know, the, the standard correlation when you're learning this in kind of like intro level finance courses is that interest rates and asset prices are going to have an inverse relationship. The thing that people always forget is the final conditional statement within that sentence, which is all else being equal. And so interest rates and asset prices are going to have an inverse relationship, all else being equal. But what happens when all else is not equal? You now add, you know, markets and asset prices are multivariate. It's not just yields this, asset prices do this. There are all of these variables influencing market dynamics and asset prices 
in any minute of any given day, right? And so when we rewind back to the prior tightening cycle from 2015 to 2018, the Fed was doing steady and moderate, very simple rate hikes of 0.25%. They forecasted that to the market. So there was no surprise, right? We also have to remember markets hate uncertainty. So we had a very certain path of monetary policy in that environment. In addition to Trump coming into office, regardless of what you think of him as a president, what we know for a fact is he decreased regulation, he decreased taxes. We had a fiscal boom, if you will, because of the uh, you know what he did from that perspective. And what did we see thereafter? We saw corporate profits start to really increase. And so when those corporate profits were increasing, they were probably increasing at a faster pace than rates were rising. So uh, asset markets were still able to grind higher in 2016 and 2017. But what started to happen in 2018? Those fiscal benefits started to wane. Interest rates were still rising. And then the Fed introduced a new variable, which was really QT, right? So they started to do what they're essentially doing right now, which is balance sheet runoff. They weren't necessarily selling treasuries and mortgage-backed securities into the open market, but they were just allowing them to mature and expire off their balance sheet and not roll over the PNI, right? So that was kind of the main dynamic and markets through that tantrum, right? So I have the chart of the S&P 500 open right now, basically starting in late January to early February, the market fell 12%. Not too long after that, in mid-March through early April, the market fell another 9%. Uh, and then, so very choppy environment, right? And then if we fast forward to basically the fourth quarter of 2018, the market hit new highs in October, but through December, it fell 20%. So we entered that kind of official bear market territory and people were going bananas. It was really kind of a yield tantrum, right? Um, after, at this point, it was basically three years of monetary tightening and now almost a full year of actual balance sheet runoff. And the market did not like that. Uh, reduced liquidity by any sense of the imagination. The same thing that we're kind of seeing in 2022 and what I'm expecting to see in 2023. And so, yeah, you're right, right? We essentially had like markets weren't just grinding higher linearly, linearly in a post great recession kind of environment pre COVID. And uh, certainly things went bananas with the monetary and fiscal bazooka that were fired in the post COVID environment. Um, but it is important to remember, right? It hasn't been absent the volatility over the course of the last 12 years. Yeah, exactly. And I, and, you know, I, I think another aspect of that, that is kind of missed is the, you know, the low interest rates when what comes with that is just the easy access to capital when it comes to businesses, right? So you obviously have a great perspective on this as you, you know, you worked in a bank and you helped, you know, manage these, these loan portfolios, so I don't know how much you can really just dive into specifics or speak more in generalities of everything like that. But, you know, for, from an outsider looking in, right, it, it, who, who's somebody, obviously, you know, I haven't worked at a bank or anything like that. I haven't had any experience with that, but I've talked to some people in this industry and other things like that. seems like, you know, a lot of companies, uh, growth companies specifically, just kind of, you know, you know, have almost try to implement this Amazon model. And what I mean by the Amazon mm -hmm. model is, you know, essentially they start off with something, right? And then they grow exponentially. They grow really quickly, but they don't really make like a, a profit, right? They're, they're potentially like losing money every year, losing money every year. And then, you know, with the hope that, bam, one day they're going to make, you know, some product like an AWS and then become super mm -hmm. profitable where it will kind of prop up maybe the other aspects of the businesses. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of companies have started to do that maybe post 2008 ish time. Like, you know, obviously they've had great, great success, but like Ubers, you know, some of those, yeah. some of those other ones, you know, um, some of the other companies like, like an Uber and maybe Netflix or some of these other ones that have just seen skyrocket growth, but really haven't made a profit are now seeming to be hurting a lot more now that, you know, that, that uh, interest rate is tightening and the, the access to liquidity, access to, you know, um, capital and everything like that is just becoming a lot harder. So, you know, wh why don't you, I guess, give us a little broad overview on like, you know, when you left around that time, like how was, uh, I guess, like the bank's loan balance sheet at that time? Was it something where, you know, anybody and their mother could have gotten called up the phone, had maybe some idea whether it's, you know, I don't know, some tech idea or like Web3 or something along those lines where it's like, hey, you know, we'll just throw money at it. Or is it, you know, that I guess my perception kind of overblown? 
Um, no, I don't think your perception is necessarily overblown. I can't divulge like specific strategies that the bank was implementing. But what I will say is the bank was 100% standing behind the clients, right? So especially to navigate through that environment, because at the end of the day, right, um, we had significant relationships with certain businesses, public and private, that were very long standing. And the bank isn't just going to abandon a relationship with a client that, you know, they've um, allocate a significant amount of time, resources, and capital into building that relationship, that trust, and that business with, right? So um, that was one thing that I really, really appreciated working at the bank is, you know, bankers are really kind of perceived to be like cutthroat. They're going to, you know, slash through everybody. Um, but I saw like um, managing directors working through the night shifts, essentially, uh, volunteering their time in order to approve SBA loans, in order to understand the regulatory environment more clearly, clearly, excuse me, all to support their clients and the business. And that was an amazing thing to see, right? Because, um, you know, uh, the banking industry, the finance industry, uh, you know, greed is good. That classic quote from uh, the Wall Street movie, right? Uh, Gordon Gecko's famous kind of saying. But when I was there firsthand, I saw a very different kind of dynamic. Maybe what I could do, though, is tie this back in, which is saying that, you know, banks, banks love higher interest rates, especially when they can pay depositors a very low interest rate because it allows their spread on their lending activities to be more profitable. And so when we think about a bank, you know, let's say um, issuing a one hundred million dollar line of credit to another business, um, you know, if the if the you know spread above LIBOR is, you know, let's call it 200 basis points versus 400 basis points, they're going to be making double the interest income on a 400 basis point environment simply because rates have gone up. So for the same amount of money that they're actually having to lend out, the bank becomes significantly more profitable in a high interest rate environment. And this is why in 2022, very early in the year, I started pointing out that loans and leases were actually rising despite interest rates going higher. And I actually said, it's not despite interest rates going higher, it's because interest rates are going higher. And so when the overall market in 2022 was very focused on recession fears, uh, geopolitical uncertainties, so on and so forth, and the Fed buckling up for a significant tightening cycle, businesses had an incentive to lock in uh, uh, new financing because they were forecasting that rates were going to go up. So, hey, if I can get a loan today at 4% versus four months from now, it's going to be 6%. I want that loan now, right? So um, especially in an uncertain environment where, hey, you know, we might be in a recession in six months. I don't know if the bank is going to be willing to lend me that money, but today they are. So let me lock this in now. Meanwhile, banks were saying, hey, you know, not too long ago, we were only getting X spread and now we're getting 2X spread. So there was an incentive from both supply of loans from the banks and demand for loans from commercial businesses to get more capital, to increase their lending. And so that's exactly what we saw in 2022. What we're starting to see now is that is kind of stabilizing. I think on a year over year rate of change basis, we're right around 10 or 11%. Um, but that number is historically elevated. We don't normally get up to these levels. And if we do, we don't stay there for too long. So it'll be interesting to see how this continues to impact market conditions because the funny thing is, right? Like uh, financial conditions today are looser than where they were in March of 2022 when the Fed did their first rate hike. So we've done all of this financial tightening um, but has it really tightened financial markets? What what really has been the net effect here, right? So um, this is something that I think people are kind of starting to wake up and realize is because the basic premise of the Fed raising rates is that they're going to reduce the demand for loans. It's been the exact opposite. Demand for loans has increased at a historic pace, despite going through one of the most historic tightening cycles ever. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, an, an interesting little anecdote that I have for you on that on that, too, is like I've just been recently speaking to to lenders because I'm thinking about taking out a HELOC on my home and then, you know, using that to re to purchase another property. And, you know, from my understanding of, of a HELOC um, and, you know, if you have a different you know definition or if you you know have some experience of this, please feel free to correct me. But from my understanding, it seems like I could it's basically like a credit. Uh, along mm -hmm. your house so it's like use it or lose it and then you know for the first 10 years before it amortized or however long the period it's usually 10 to 15 years it's an interest only payment and that interest rate is volatile uh, like it can change based on the yep. feds interest rates so what 
you know, anecdotally speaking to some people who I know in real estate and other things like that, they're noticing a lot more people starting to take out HELOCs as well because their their thought is, hey, you know, I'm going to take out this HELOC now um, while I can afford maybe a little bit higher of these interest only payments. And then, you know, once the Fed starts loosening up and maybe either pivots or starts lowering rates or or stops raising rates or whatever, that's when my home is going to start making some money. And so that's when I'll be able to pay back this loan pretty aggressively, you know, come 2024. So uh, they're seeing like, you know, kind of an increase in HELOC loans being taken out too, which is, you know, kind of interesting because the, the perception around the housing market, at least for the average Joe, it seems is that it's a bad time to buy a house because interest rates are high. Whereas, mm. you know, it's like from the investor standpoint, they're ready to, to bounce and get right back in the market. So it's, it's, you know, I think it's overall kind of an interesting dynamic just, just on everything, not only stock market, but housing market and just overall macro environment. So, you know, but that brings me to kind of where we're at right now in this market, right? So you got out of the banking industry 2021-ish time, and then, you know, you've been just analyzing markets through 2022, which, like you said, we had a big recession fear kind of for that entire year. But the beginning of this year, you know, we're, we're recording this February 22nd is, is pretty interesting, right? I mean, we had, you know, companies like Tesla and some of these others shoot up 90% and extreme, extreme volatility and, and seemingly upwards throughout the first month, month and a half of this year. Um, so, you know, I guess, what is your overall perspective on the market right now? And I'll leave it kind of broad on, on that end for you. Appreciate it. Um, interesting to hear the, you know, firsthand experience you're having right now with HELOCs. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, let's tie this in the markets, right? So let me first say this is that bear markets always have significant and violent relief rallies, right? So that's what we saw in June through August of 2022. The S&P 500 gained 18%. The NASDAQ was even more than that. And then what happened? We produced new year to date lows, right? So um, this is what really kind of leads to investor kind of capitulation, if you will, from like an actual um, like supply and demand standpoint, as I would say. Um, I think for the past, um, I don't know, maybe almost two years, we've really been in kind of like an enthusiasm capitulation, right? And I think it's like important to bifurcate like this enthusiasm cap capitulation where there's excess and, you know, the market is really being fueled by FOMO. We're certainly not in that environment today, even though maybe you could make that argument in the past month, we've been in this kind of state of FOMO and excess and exuberance. That's been my general thesis, but significantly different than the type of market dynamics that we had in the first quarter of 2021. In 2022, we really got a little bit more into the, you know, supply and demand price capitulation, but even still, right? Like uh, if we look at something like the VIX, we didn't get a spike in volatility that would normally be congruent with um, an actual kind of capitulation, a bear market recessionary type capitulation. So I don't think we've had that yet. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's going to be coming in 2023. However, I think that this latest market rally um, and this is how I've kind of been internalizing things has really given investors an opportunity to reduce risk in their portfolio, to take some chips off the table, to raise cash. That was the basic theme that I had in 2022. And so I think, in, you know, I did a tweet, I think in December, late December, basically talking about how 2022 was a year of de-risking your portfolio, raising capital, um, and kind of sitting on your hands a little bit, right? Not being, um, excessive in fear or greed, Right. In 2023, I was saying is I think 2023 is going to be a year of allocation. That's largely because I think asset prices are going to be going lower this year. And so me being 27 years old, I want to take advantage of those low prices if I'm trying to build a portfolio for the next five, 10 years, maybe even longer. And so, you know, that's still kind of my basic premise and presupposition for 2023 as I think about market dynamics. I think that there is uncertainly a high risk of a recession this year. The Fed's playbook historically is very simple. They're going to keep interest rates too low for too long and then start raising very late into the credit cycle. They're going to keep rates elevated for too long until a recession comes, a financial crisis comes, and they're forced to cut interest rates. And so where are we in that cycle right now? Well, the Fed is keeping interest rate. I mean, we've just gone through one of the most historic tightening cycles in modern financial history, right? Like we, the only comparable situation that we have is, you know, the, infl uh, the inflationary cycle in the late 70s and the early 80s. Um, inflation hasn't nearly been uh, as monumental as it was, you know, 40 plus years ago, but 
you know, we've seen a congruent uh, dynamic in terms of, of monetary policy, right, in terms of the tightening cycle. And so, um, you know, my basic stance is that somehow, somewhere, a crack is going to show up. Um, we, we don't necessarily know where. I don't want to say it's like a black swan type of event because that's certainly not my general thesis. But, uh, you know, the Fed always breaks something. Like uh, one guy I always listen to and have listened to for a very long time is Hugh Hendry. And one thing that he's been saying on his pod podcast, The Acid Capitalist, a lot lately is, can anyone tell me one time when the Fed has gotten it right? When was the last time the Fed got something right? Um, and that's a super fair question, right? So they make policy mistakes all the time to a varying degree, right? So a mistake is a spectrum. It's not just a binary, oh, we made a mistake. Well, did they really fuck it up or did they just kind of, you know, trip over themselves a little bit? And excuse my language, I, <laughs> but, um, you know, so I think given the magnitude and circumstances of monetary policy that we've had for not even the last year, right? I mean, the Fed did their first rate hike in March of 2022. It's been 11 months of rate hikes. Like, let's really see how this actually ripples through, right? This effect doesn't just happen kind of overnight. And so, um, you know, there's a classic phrase and saying from Milton Friedman that monetary policy acts with a long and variable lag. We don't know how long and variable that lag is going to be. But generally, if we kind of look at Fed history, if you will, like I said, when was the last time the Fed got something right? They always make small or large policy mistakes. And given the magnitude of their latest, um, you know, uh, policy stance and policy decisions, it's reasonable to expect that the magnitude of their mistake could be quite severe. We'll wait and see and, and you know, see how severe it is if and when we get there. But I don't think we can ignore that, right? And so like, I always start with um, the Fed first and foremost. And that kind of operates as my green light, yellow light, red light for risk. And certainly when we're still undergoing a monetary tightening cycle, um, when the Fed is conducting a form of QT via balance sheet runoff, um, that again is going to put me in this kind of red light for risk, especially in the short term. But, um, you know, despite being kind of negative on things on the, on the short term, I still want to be opportunistic because short term pain kind of creates long term gain, right? It's that classic kind of cliche where you want to be buying when there's blood in the streets. I don't necessarily think that we've had blood in the streets yet, um, but I've still been buying, right? So I'm patiently kind of increasing my portfolio exposure, if you will. Yeah. And that, that's kind of interesting that you say that, right? Because it, it you know, that obviously the mantra is buy low, sell high, right? I mean, everybody <laughs> in, in a perfect world, you can do that. But when it actually comes to brass tax, it doesn't seem like very many people are able to implement that. I mean, it sounds so easy, right? But I mean, it, it is it is difficult, especially in a time right now, right, where it's like, have we hit the bottom? Is there, you know, what's some sort of uncertainty? And then, you know, maybe people are FOMOing into things like Tesla or other things like that. But, you know, it, it's interesting how you brought up something's going to crack, right? Because we've mm -hmm. kind of started to see some things, you know, show some signs of weakness, definitely in the consumer side of things. Um, we've seen, uh, it, it's interesting, we've seen spending and like, you know, companies like Walmart and some of these others that have reported earnings for Q4 of last year, which historically, you know, around the holidays, it is pretty good. Um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, those companies have beaten expectations in Q4. So, um, when it comes to revenue and other things like that, so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out come Q1 time. But, you know, as far as like the consumer goes, right, I mean, that's what kind of, I guess, the backbone of the economy, right? People spending, capitalism, right, et cetera, et cetera. So the Fed has taught, Jerome Powell specifically has talked about the unemployment number. That's a that's a, something that he tracks, right? So, right. you know, I, like, I'll just ask you a broad question, and then I want you mm -hmm. to kind of dive in a little bit more onto it, though, um, is, you know, what is, I guess, the relationship between unemployment and raising interest rates? And then the follow up on that is, OK, you know, as we've kind of seen interest rates uh, shoot up at a historic pace, why do you feel that interest rate or that the unemployment rate is still at, you know, a historically low value? Man, that is a fantastic question. I haven't actually been asked kind of something along those lines. So first and foremost, you asked, you know, what is the relationship between kind of a Fed tightening cycle and, you know, uh, labor market conditions, and let's just focus specifically on the unemployment rate, right? And so um, let's really put our, ourselves like in the Fed shoes, right? And so the Fed really uses a Keynesian model where growth and inflation are directly correlated. So as growth goes up, inflation is likely to go up as well, or at least remain um, maybe somewhat elevated, if you will. And so 
a lot of that growth engine is really going to be fueled, as you properly pointed out, by overall demand, which is then going to be fueled by, well, what's the labor market looking like, right? Because if, if people aren't out earning an income and their incomes aren't growing, how is demand going to grow necessarily? There's obviously ways around that. Um, but so like, let's think of it this way, right? Is the strength in the labor market has been antithetical to the Fed's goals, right? Because what the Fed wants to see in order for demand to come down and therefore inflation to come down is for aggregate incomes to come down, right? So one thing that I've been talking about since 2022 is like, they're trying to do this through three primary methods. They're trying to create an inverse wealth effect. So as the value of people's homes and portfolios go down, theoretically, they're going to be consuming less because their paper wealth is, uh, is less, right? It's smaller than it used to be. Um, second of all, they're trying to um, increase the cost of capital and therefore theoretically to decrease the demand for lending. As we properly pointed out at the beginning of this podcast, we've seen the exact opposite. So that's been ant antithetical to the Fed. Um, and uh, third and foremost, right, is if the cost of capital is higher, it's likely going to be the case that maybe as interest expenses are going up, that the demand for labor might also come back down, right? And so as the kind of financial system tightens up, that ripples through the fundamental economy, aggregate um, income should start to come down because we'll see some weakness in the unemployment rate. Again, we also haven't seen that take place, right? So that was been a big thing in my overall thesis and outlook for 2023 is, you know, we're finally going to see, like they've increased the cost of capital, but it hasn't actually had a material impact on decreasing the demand for capital. That's been very interesting to see. We've certainly, the Fed has certainly created an inverse wealth effect, right? That's, you know, very safe to say. The one thing we really haven't seen at all is an impact on the labor market. And the fact that it's been so resilient has been amazing to see, right? I don't think uh, most people kind of had that on, on their bingo card in 2022, um, even myself. Um, even though, you know, at the end of 2021, I was saying, I think we're going to go into a stage of a stronger labor market. But then once we started to see the Fed go from, hey, we're going to likely do two to three rate hikes in 2022 to all of a sudden, oh my God, right? We're doing, you know, 450 basis points of rate hikes. Um, it's a totally different tune, right? And so I expected to see some of that weakness in the labor market that we didn't actually get. And so if we look at the latest data, we have 3.4% unemployment rate. We have jolts back over right around 11 million, I think, per the latest data. That massively came in way higher than expected. Um, let's think about this, right? The, you know, the, the unemployment rate right now, 3.4% is the lowest since I think May of 1969, maybe June. Um, you know, this is a very unique time, right? Even if we look at a 3.5% unemployment rate, there have only been six or seven times now since 1970, where we've had an unemployment rate of 3.5% specifically. And one of them was, you know, the month just before this 3.4%. So, you know, so I think that was in December. Um, so we are unequivocally in a very, very tight labor market, um, which, you know, certainly has its weaknesses, but I think unequivocally it's been way stronger than anyone expected. And the proper way to actually, you know, kind of diagnose the labor market, you know, maybe some people wouldn't concede to the fact that the labor market is strong, but the words that I've specifically been trying to use, especially in my newsletters is that the labor market has been resilient and dynamic and you can't argue with those two, right? You can argue with strong, but you can't argue with resilient and dynamic. That's just like an objective truth, right? And so, um, you know, with demand continuing to stay fairly high, right? Like we got that retail sales data for January and that came in way hotter than expected. I think it was right at 3%. And so that's a nominal um, retail sales figure. So even if we adjust it for the inflation that we had in the month of January, I think the month over month level was like 0.5%. So we had real retail sales of like 2.5% on a month over month basis. That is super strong, especially considering that the December data came in much weaker than expected. We were somewhere in the negative territory, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, so, you know, that's very interesting to see, right? And so I'll leverage some comments that um, Jeffrey Gunlock has mentioned, which is every time we've seen the unemployment rate go above its 12 month moving average, we've seen a material weakness and deterioration in the overall economic conditions, right? And so um, my back of the envelope math is basically that the 12 month moving average for the unemployment rate is right around 3.8%. And the current unemployment rate, like we just talked about is 3.4%. So I expect to see that unemployment rate tick back up higher. It's been very interesting to see the fact that all of these layoff announcements, 
backward looking implications haven't really had a significant ripple into something like the layoffs rate or, you know, the quits rate is still historically elevated. There's an abundance of opportunities. Jolts are historically high, right? It's, it's not meshing quite well. And so, you know, maybe there's some data discrepancies or, you know, they're moving around with these kind of adjustments and seasonal changes and so on and so forth. But like I said, the labor market has been extremely dynamic, extremely resilient. We're at 3.4%. I expect that number to climb in 2023. I don't know the pace with which it's going to climb. That's going to be kind of the, the main um, variable, I would say, because I think most of the market's expectations, even the Fed's SEP uh, is saying that we'll get to 4.6% unemployment in 2023 and in 2024 and 4. Point, excuse me, 4.5% in 2025. So they're expecting a mid 4% unemployment rate this year, next year, and 2025. And so regardless of how that acceleration happens above that 12-month moving average, it's likely going to come within the next 12 months, which likely means we'll enter into a period of economic softness. So we'll see how that kind of evolves going forward. But at a high level, those are my kind of broader thoughts on, on labor market dynamics right now. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And so for those who don't know, like a little bit of the background of the show, I don't give him any questions or anything like that beforehand. <laughs> so he's just spitting all this off the top of his head. So I mean, obviously, Caleb brings uh, excellent insights, but you brought up, you know, one of the facts about the, the headlines, right? I mean, everybody has seen it, right? Google, Amazon, you know, Disney, all these big tech giants. Laying Meta off. just announced more today. Yeah, ten thousands or seven thousand, you know, numbers in the thousands, uh, maybe up to ten thousand and more of layoffs. But like, like you said, you know, we're we're kind of seeing a discrepancy when it comes to, you know, the unemployment and maybe these announcements. You know, do you think that that is, I guess, maybe more specific to the growth companies and kind of you know these big tech companies, just simply because you know, like like we talked about a little bit earlier, the easy access to capital, seeing these tech companies not really have to make a profit just yet. And now that everything's kind of tightening around them, they're like, all right, I need to cut the bottom line, the CapEx expenditures first. And, you know, the easy out is, is you know, laying off a bunch of the staff and hoping that everything runs still smoothly. So do you kind of see that as, as uh, you know, I guess the early indicator is like tech is laying off and then you'll look for other sectors to kind of follow that trend? Or, uh, you know, I guess, how do you see that the labor market kind of, I guess, uh, you know, playing out on that? Yeah, so that's the right point to make, right? Which is that um, as that cost of capital is going up, um, you know, uh, holding on to expensive labor is going to become more and more costly, right? And so we're seeing those layoffs happen in tech. There's two things that I want to say to kind of contextualize those layoffs, which is first and foremost, tech jobs only account for estimates are, you know, roughly 2% of the entire labor force in the United States. So those layoffs and headlines seem very kind of doomsday-ish, but in reality, they don't have as significant of an impact as most people think. And we also have to remember, these are some of the most marketable, skilled people in today's uh, economy, coders, uh, software engineers, so on and so forth. They have no problem and issues going out and finding a new job or, hey, maybe even doing their own startup, right? And, you know, creating more small business. That's a great thing. Um, the second thing I'd like to contextualize the tech layoffs with is these are some of the companies that were leading the hiring sprees in 2020 and 2021, and even in the, fir in the first half of 2022. So perhaps they overhired and now they're course corrected, right? So it's not like they didn't hire anybody for two and a half years. Now they're letting people go who have been with the company, right? It's like, certainly they're letting people go who have been, you know, longtime uh, members and employees of those teams. Um, but we also have to contextualize it of like net hiring over the course of the last two to three years. And I think over, overall, they're almost certainly still um, net hirers, right, is maybe how we could classify them. I think the, the crux of your question really was about how um, these kind of tech layoffs might be a precursor or an early stage indicator of more layoffs to come across the broader economy. And I think that's a very safe assumption. I wouldn't argue with that. Um, and so maybe what we could say, generally speaking, is like every um, every mass layoff period is going to maybe be led by tech uh, jobs first. Right. And then maybe you start getting into sales, you start getting into marketing and then you start getting more into like the actual uh, producers, if you will. And the thing is, obviously, we, we're, we're primarily a service sector economy. So if you're letting go of, of producers like, uh, yeah, they're just producing services. Right. So just I just want to contextualize that. Um, but not, so let me say it this way is like every, uh, mass layoff 
period, uh, recessionary period is probably going to be led by tech layoffs, but not every period of tech layoffs is going to lead to a period of mass layoffs. Does that make sense? Right? So when you're working with those early stage indicators, you're not always going to get the follow through into the worst case scenario. It could just be a speed bump blip. And then we were, we, we normalize, right? So that's still on the table for this year. But again, we have to contextualize that dynamic versus kind of the broader monetary and macro perspectives that the U.S. economy and that the Fed are, are kind of grappling with this year. Yeah. And I mean, that's a great explanation. And I kind of like that, right? That, it, you know, we could have this little blip in the road, but it still could be fine and kind of end out, you know, where we're not seeing, I guess, the the overall effects of massive amounts of layoffs across the board, right? It could be maybe a little bit more of a lagging in, indicator or other things like that. But I want to kind of move into a little bit more of like market dynamics and kind of where we're going, right? You alluded to it a little bit earlier in this talk where we're having the FOMC meeting minutes potentially coming out during this uh, conversation. So, you know, uh, maybe maybe we'll get some bad hindsight in this um, <laughs> and people will be making fun of it afterwards. But, you know, it seems like everything's kind of uh, surrounded by these bird metaphors, right? We got hawkish, we got dovish, like what is Powell's kind of overall tone in these min minutes? And, uh, you know, the market seems to react violently one way or the other, depending on, you know, how the Fed is reacting towards that. So, you know, we, we've talked about the Fed a little bit throughout this this podcast, you know, where they, they haven't really done anything right. Right. I mean, essentially, they, they started raising really late in the game. They raised drastically really high. They're going to basically raise until it breaks, it seems. So, you know, I guess how do you kind of see all this playing out? Right. We've had. You know, people on the camp of the soft landing, the hard landing, the no landing, you know, no like landing. hawkish, <laughs> dovish, like what is all these things? Like, you know, I guess uh, you kind of went into a little bit of your thesis earlier, but why don't you kind of dive into, I guess, dive into it fully, see how, how you see Powell kind of reacting to this overall market conditions. And uh, yeah, now the floor is yours. So I think like in and of itself, you know, we've had this massive market rally and in and of itself, the Fed can't necessarily be happy with the market rally because it um, kind of combats their intent of creating an inverse wealth effect. So as these asset prices go on this massive rip, right? Like let's take Nvidia, for example, the stock was up 110% since the lows in October. It's obviously given back some of those gains, but when you have one of the most, uh, you know, one of the largest companies in the U S stock market, you know, increasing its market cap by 110% in the course of four months, um, you know, that could create a ripple effect into actual spending depends on how much credence you really put into the wealth effect. Right. But so I think let's tie this back into what took place um, with the feds latest quarter basis point rate hike and um, kind of Powell's press conference thereafter. I think a lot of people really interpreted um, Powell's press conference as being dovish. I didn't see it as either hawkish or dovish. I just saw it as, um, you could certainly say less hawkish, right? Uh, but I think he just remained very objective. And, you know, I'm very biased because I really, really like Jerome Powell. I think, you know, um, I, I think he's, you know, magnitudes better than Janet Yellen was. Um, and so I think he handled the questions perfectly. Uh, he had somewhat of an error in saying that financial conditions have tightened um, because regardless of what metric you look at, even the Fed's own data, um, you know, if you look at the national financial conditions index, I think the Chicago fed publishes that, um, you know, it's loosened significantly, especially since October of 2022. So where's the tightening really taking place there? I don't know what he's looking at per se. So I think, you know, like, so the minutes came out, I'm seeing, right. Just some stuff from like Walter Bloomberg and stuff like this on, on Twitter that, um, some participants saw elevated prospect of a recession in 2023, Almost all Fed officials backed a 25 basis point hike at the last meeting in, in quotes, a few end quotes, officials favored or could have backed the 50 basis point hike. And the Fed saw upside inflation risks as a key factor shaping their outlook. I think since, um, you know, the Fed's meeting that ended on, I was either February 1st or 2nd, um, you know, we've seen some comments, uh, whether it's from Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed or um, Bullard, you know, really kind of coming out and talking about how, hey, you know, we might need to go back to a 50 basis point and that's not off the table. And so the market has kind of um, woken up to that realization over the course of the past few weeks. And I think that's why we're seeing some of the enhanced selling pressure um, in the market. But, you know, clearly the market right now likes the Fed minutes. The S&P right now, as we're recording, this is up 0.36% on the session. Um, after, you know, earlier this morning being down quite considerably off the daily lows, the index is up almost 
uh, 75 basis points. So nice little intraday rally there. Um, so market seems quite appeased, I think, overall. Um, so I think regardless of whether the Fed is doing 25 basis points or 50 basis points, maybe they go back to 75 basis points, maybe they pause, who knows, right? But nonetheless, what we know for certain is that the Fed isn't done raising rates, even if they're just going to go forward with 25 basis points going forward. They're still conducting balance sheet runoff. So that's has a both of those things have a net impact of reducing liquidity. Right. So we can get into, you know, these TGA dynamics that a lot smarter people than me are on Twitter talking about and how, you know, that whole thing is impacting overall um, liquidity conditions. Um, we could talk about reserves. We could talk about the overnight reverse repurchase uh, facility, so on and so forth. But nonetheless, if the Fed is raising rates and allowing um, assets on their balance sheet to run off and mature, that's going to have an impact of, of reducing liquidity in the markets. And, you know, if liquidity is declining, all else being equal, again, key conditional statement there, all else being equal, interest, or excuse me, uh, asset prices should fall, right? So if you have one asset that, you know, has the same future cash flows at the same interest rate, but is way less liquid, it's going to trade at a lower price than an asset with the same uh, conditional factors of, of cash flows and interest rates, but is way more liquid. The one that's way more liquid is always going to have a higher price because if I own it, I know that I could sell it to somebody, right? So all else being equal, right? That's what I'm saying is uh, lower liquidity equals lower asset prices. And so, you know, that's kind of my general thesis. Obviously this, this market, you know, I certainly did not foresee this bear market rally. Um, did I switch my mind and play it um, to the upside in the short term? Yeah, I did, right? So I was, I was messing around in some altcoins. I was trading um, some like leveraged ETFs to the upside. I'm generally positioned more short right now in my trading portfolio. But again, in my long-term portfolio, I'm using this as an opportunity generally to be increasing my exposure um, to kind of core portfolio holdings that I really like. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question specifically, but I'm happy to take this anywhere you'd like. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, I, I think you did. So you kind of went through, you know, what you're doing right now and kind of how you're viewing the overall market. But, you know, I, I kind of like to ask this question and it is it's tough and, you know, obviously it's not financial advice or anything like that. But generally speaking, in, during a recession, there's always some sort of sector that kind of comes out better on the other side and kind All of, right. uh, you know, where it works, you know, some something happens in whatever recession it is, some economic downturn, but there's always one or two sectors that seem to be prosperous. And, you know, essentially whatever company you kind of throw money at in those sectors, you seem to be beating the market. So based on like, you know, you've kind of outlined the overall macro conditions, you know, obviously we've got some geopolitical risk in Ukraine and Russia and everything like that. So that's probably its own separate podcast that we could get into for, for a long period of time. But, you know, other than that, obviously there's the common sectors that people think about the energy sectors or, you know, oil and gas, that, that kind of thing. But are there any sectors that you think, you know, based on, uh, on your knowledge of the overall macro environment, kind of the the global landscape of everything that you think are probably going to come out like a little bit better on the on the other side, and obviously not financial advice. I said I put the the um, thing at the, the disclaimer at the beginning of the episode as well. So, um, but go for it, man. So um, you raise a great point, which is that from an industry perspective, I think every every bear market ends differently. And we see new leadership coming out of that bear market different every time. And usually it's going to depend on what was the catalyst for the bear market, right? So what were the stocks that were kind of leading the way higher in the 2020 new bull market, right? Or even, you know, at the depths of the bear market, we had Netflix, we had uh, Zoom, we had software as service companies, we had B2B SaaS, right? All of those are what were what lead... Uh, I mean, all of those stocks were leading the way higher during that period because they were the largest beneficiaries of that environment and kind of a post COVID environment, right? Pelotons, Zoom, um, you know, different cloud stocks, so on and so forth. Um, and then especially when you consider the fact that, you know, the Fed launched a monetary bazooka at the economy, kept those interest rates at zero and just flooded the market with liquidity. When, when, you know, liquidity is always going to impact long duration stocks the most. So if, if liquidity is rising, long duration stocks like tech and growth names are going to benefit the most. If liquidity is falling, they're going to get hurt the most, right? And so that's really kind of on a, on a short-term perspective. So I think what I would generally say is like, um, if we just think about like sectors, right? So we'll have healthcare, we'll have real estate, we'll have technology, we'll have um, industrials, utilities, uh, 
what's always going to lead the way higher is going to be tech and consumer discretionary, right? Always. Um, during the bear market, what's going to survive the most is going to be utilities and consumer staples, right? Um, those are always going to provide you the most protection, the least amount of volatility, and the asset prices aren't going to move nearly as much. They're going to pay you a dividend. They're going to be a little bit, uh, they're going to have this uh, buffer of safety, if you will, which is going to allow them to survive that bear market better, but not necessarily benefit the most in the birth of a new bull market. That's always going to be the riskiest segments, right? So the things to have an eye on, generally speaking, are going to be tech, consumer discretionary, and crypto um, from you know my overall perspective. How am I kind of navigating my portfolio right now? So earlier this year in late January, I reduced my exposure to stocks like NVIDIA and LAM Research. Those are two of my favorite companies, but after they went up so much, you know, I was down pretty substantially on those positions for my long-term portfolios because I started buying them in mid-2022. And I had the opportunity to sell them at a positive gain after going up, you know, 100% for NVIDIA, after going up 80% for LAM Research. You know, even Agilent Technologies was a stock that I owned in a, in a portfolio. It was up 120% because I bought it a long time ago. I was like, eh, I think I'm going to de-risk that position now. Now, so I sold half of it. The other 50% of it is now only up 100%, right? So it's given back a good chunk of those gains. But again, right, so I de-risked the portfolio in terms of taking some chips off the table. But at the same time, I have to recognize, look, I'm 27 years old. I want to be a net buyer of assets for any given year. So at the end of the day, I still need to be buying something. So what do I want to buy during this period? Some stocks in particular that I've been looking at and actually allocating capital and money into are mostly going to be in um, some REITs. So in particular, I'm looking at like self-storage stocks, like extra space storage. I own that. It pays a dividend yield above 4%. Digital Realty Trust, same story there. It's a data center real estate investment trust. So they own all these kind of data centers across, um, you know, cross borders, right? So they're an international company. Um, and they're the second largest data center REIT next to Equinix. Um, which is also a stock that I own, but I haven't been purchasing it. Um, I actually reduced exposure to Equinix as well because they went on a pretty massive rally. Um, another stock I'm buying, Republic Services Group. Um, it's a dividend growth stock. And guess what they do? They're a waste management and collection services company. So waste isn't going anywhere anytime soon. They're fairly recession proof, even if their stock is going to you know, fall during a recession, but the core business is going to be super strong. So again, I'm moving slightly into these utilities. Um, Things of that nature, right? What's another thing I've been buying? Brookfield Corporation, ticker symbol BN. Um, they're just like a massive kind of asset management conglomerate. They own a lot of, you know, renewable energy sites. They own an amazing portfolio of commercial real estate internationally. These guys are some of the best money managers on Wall Street, um, even though they're a Canadian company. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I've certainly been buying that and continue to buy that there. Um, especially as they continue to kind of scale their insurance and financial services business even more broadly. And so for me, right, like I'm, I'm staying defensive overall because I don't think that the pain of the market is behind us. But if the pain of the market is behind us, these stocks are still going to do well, not as well as stocks like NVIDIA and those other things that are going to show leadership in the, in the birth of a new bull market. But I'm not convinced we're in the, bull, in the birth of a new bull market, right? So I'm trying to stay defensive, especially in an environment where cash is paying you 5%. Right. You can go right now into your Fidelity account and at no minimums buy a money market fund that's paying you 4.3, 4.4% and just sit back and collect some dough. Right. So, you know, even if you're putting, you know, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars into that, it's going to generate you a pretty solid return. And so when 4.3% is your hurdle rate, or if you look at the six month treasury yield giving you 5.03 or the one year treasury yield basically giving you the same amount. Hey, like, uh, you know, I'm okay to lend my money to the government for the next six months to a year for an annualized return above 5%. That sounds pretty good to me, um, especially when, you know, I, I generally view that recession risks are elevated and there could be tailwinds for yields to fall, right? So the Fed is obviously still raising rates right now. So yields generally have tailwinds to rise. But as we continue to get further and further into the rate hike cycle, risks become skewed to the Fed making that policy mistake that we talked about earlier. Right. So as as they continue to tighten um, those those treasuries, particularly on the shorter scale, I would say less than two years become more and more attractive because it allows me as an investor to a capitalize on that yield, secure that yield and benefit in the event that yields do go lower because we go into a recession. And I'm over here waving a, a one year treasury yield at five point oh three percent when the market rate is now below three. Right. Hey, look what I have. Come get this five. 5% uh, annualized return for the next three months and everyone's going to want it, right? So that, that's kind of how I'm viewing things overall right now. 
Yeah, it is interesting that you say that, right? I mean, because like essentially you, you had one tweet that said, you know, cash is 5% at this point. So, I mean, it, it seems like it's it's almost like, you know, uh, people have been kind of hating on the 60-40 bond stock portfolio and everything like that. Obviously, you know, you, you almost get a high yield savings account, I think, at this point of 3 to 4%. So, I mean, you know, if, if you are worried about, you know, potential recessions or other things like that, it might be a, you know, a good play to potentially just, you know, have the money and just kind of park it somewhere, like you said, like six months to a year or something like that, and still generate a pretty solid return, especially, you know, if the overall stock market starts to crash and goes down, which, you know, it seems like the Fed is kind of hinting towards that and kind of going towards that as well. So, you know, all in all, it is uh, definitely an interesting time and there's going to be a lot to talk about and track throughout this year. Um, we are seeing a nice uh, little bear market rally, but you know, we'll see where, where it turns from here. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I put you on the hot seat during this FOMC meetings coming out and everything like that, but you answered a lot of great questions uh, or a lot of questions greatly with, uh, you know, some in-depth responses. So I really appreciate you coming on and giving me your time today, but why don't you tell everybody where they can find you, what you got going on and uh, how they can follow up on some of your research. Well, first of all, Brandon, uh, you asked phenomenal questions. So I'm glad to hear that you thought I gave great responses. That's always um, very much appreciated. This was awesome to get to meet you like this and to have the ability. I know we've talked on spaces a couple of times now, but it's always cool to um, chat a little bit more personable like this. Um, and by the way, we're seeing stocks kind of push back into negative territory here. So always interesting to see this kind of dynamic with uh, a massive kind of Fed event, right? So um, Look, you can find me on Twitter. It's just my first and last name. So at Caleb Franzen, um, I have a link there in my bio, and I'm sure you'll put something down um, in the description for my newsletter. It's a free edition that I publish every Saturday. Definitely just subscribe to that. Get a, ten, uh, a, a sense and taste for you know how I approach my analysis. I call it cubic analytics. Got to take this three-pillar approach of looking at the macro, the stock market, and Bitcoin. And so each edition, each free edition is going to cover new analysis and charts, almost always exclusive in addition to some of the stuff that I'm posting on Twitter, um, each of those three sections. So if you're interested in one of those things or all three, I promise there's going to be something in there for you. You're going to find some value out of it and it's free. Um, so definitely check me out there. Those are really the two main channels, right? Just my Twitter and my Substack, cubicanalytics.substack.com. So uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come on and uh, sharpen our iron together. So this was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, of course. And yeah, like you said, I'm going to put everything in the show notes, Twitter and his sub stack. So be sure to subscribe to that and follow him on Twitter is great stuff. He puts out great charts and threads and everything like that. And I, I, I left it a little short here. I feel like I could talk to you for days at this point. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to have you back on some point in the future. Round two. Let's do it. Yeah, man. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate it. All right, bro.